I am really excited about what we're going to uh, have a conversation about today. I've got some amazing people that have agreed to join us and share their wisdom and their experience, a hard-won experience in, in, in every case, about, uh, about doing what we do. So um, we're going to start with a premise and then we'll do some introductions, but uh, most of what we talk about when we get together at the Grass-Fed Exchange and most of what for, the, for producers anyway, most of our life is spent trying to figure out how do, we, how do we raise something regeneratively? How do we manage our soils? How do we manage our grasses? And we push ourselves to do a really good job with that. And if, we, if we're good and if we're successful, something leaves our property that is very nourishing for whoever's going to eat it. And in the process of raising it, we made our soils, our little piece of creation, better than we found it. That's our goal, right? That's what we want to try to do. We wake up in the morning trying to figure that out. Um, but there's oftentimes a long and tortured pathway that that product, in whatever form it is when it leaves our possession, takes before it gets to the end consumer, um, customer, eater, or wearer, in the case of Rebe what Rebecca is going to talk about. And uh, one of the things, after spending 15 years building a marketing company, I guess a little bit about my background for those of you that don't know me, uh, I started a grass-fed beef company in 2003, and it's all Mike Lawrence's fault. Uh, I was a part-time CFO for his startup meat processing business in Minnesota, and he introduced me to Michael Pollan, or an article Michael Pollan wrote that profoundly changed the, the trajectory of my life. And I went on to found one of the, the first grass-fed beef marketing companies called Thousand Hills Cattle Company. Uh, that was in 2003. I sold it in 2015 to my longtime business partner, who's, um, who's also here and who's done a great job continuing it on. Um, but I had become, by 2015, really jaded about what we were doing. We worked so hard to create this incredible product. And then we have to push it through, that's regenerative. And then we have to push it through what, in my opinion, is a very degenerative supply chain to a customer who may or may not value and appreciate all the, the incredible richness of uh, benefits, both to themselves in terms of taste and flavor and nutrition, but also to the environment um, in terms of animal welfare. We do so many good things that we don't necessarily get credit for. Uh, and so it's really hard work. I mean, we know it's hard work to go out and, and get dirty every day and produce regeneratively raised livestock. But it's also incredibly hard work to try to take those, take the care and the, and the competence and the excellence that was used to raise that product. And what we do is we take that and we have to try to shepherd it through a supply chain that doesn't really think it wants it and doesn't value it, and get it to an end customer who, who does value it enough to pay a premium for it. Um, so that's what we do. That's what the, the five of us do every day. And um, we want to have, we want to talk about the process for that, because there's, there's a very small number of people that want to buy their food in a face-to-face -face transaction with the person that raised it. That's, probably less than 1% of the buying public. And that means that nearly everybody that buys our food is going to have, it isn't, it isn't going to be a face-to-face -face transaction directly with the farmer. Somebody else is going to have to be involved in that. Uh, and I'm really passionate about trying to figure out how do we, how do we bring the same regenerative thinking to, to the way that we distribute all those great things that we're currently putting into the production. And we got that, so we got that small sliver of customers that want a face-to-face -face transaction. They're already over-served. They're already oversupplied by regenerative products because um, we're adding more new regenerative producers to the landscape than we're adding consumers who want a face-to-face -face transaction with them that doesn't involve some kind of a third party. So where we're not, in my opinion, where we're not keeping up is building out those regenerative supply chains. And that's what these four people spend their, their life's work uh, doing. 
So I'd like each of you to introduce yourselves, and you can, you can, I'm happy to get a biographical information, but what I really want is I want you to focus on answering one question. Why do you care about this? There's way easier ways to get paid to market stuff than doing what all of you are doing. So you want to start us out, yeah, Kirk? Yeah. Uh, I'm Kirk Blanchard with uh, Epic Provisions. Can you guys, is this volume pretty? Okay, we're, 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 we're kind of hand mic in this thing here, so we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, Kirk with Epic Provisions. A um, little background about me. I've been with Epic since we uh, founded and started the company uh, around the end of 2012, uh, early 2013. Um, and it's been quite a quite a journey to uh, my present life form um, with, with, within the company, and I'm sure we'll dig into those details. But um, why I care, um, really just to get right to it, is because um, I knew, we, all of us knew, we were super passionate that there was a, a, a way to create a better food system uh, and help connect consumers with that. Um, but just like uh, Todd spoke about there, there was a big felt like a big gap between how do we connect um, the consumer with what everybody in this room uh, is so passionate about what they do every day what they believe in what we believe in we you know and some industries get a bad rap for it but it's how do we turn that around and how do we help educate a consumer and bring that bring the work that everyone in this room does on a daily basis uh, in front of them. And once we can start uh, communicating that message, uh, we felt like we could start making a positive impact and creating some change. And that's a hell of a thing to do, and it is hard, and it is challenging and difficult uh, in every way, shape, or form, um, because there's, you know, at every turn, you've got folks that are constantly maybe, maybe, um, coming at you, but um, I can tell you that, that, that we, uh, it feels like we're, we're on the right path and we continue to make a big impact. So I care because um, I, I want to help heal and change the land um, through animal impact and, and to help connect consumers with um, back to their, their meat and their food and, and, and the folks who care about it and raise it. So give, give us just a, like two, a minute and a half or two minutes. What is Epic? Because yeah, so Epic is, um, I mean, we, we set out as, as a group of us, it's pretty funny, we were kind of in, in uh, endurance athletes doing some, some crazy long distance running and bike rides and all this, you know, goofy stuff that you think back on, you're like, who the hell, why would you, and why, do, why don't you even do that stuff? But anyway, we, you know, we were going through and, and um, even the founders, Katie and Taylor, um, had thought that they need to eliminate all meat from their diet. They were total vegan, vegetarian, and had started a plant-based um, bar company prior to Epic. And when I first met them, they were like vegan, or, or they had just transformed. They, they thought that if they eliminated uh, meat from their diet because of uh, animal welfare purposes that they disagreed with and some, some things that they read about uh, some industrial raised meats and, and, and things that were involved with that, um, they thought if they eliminated that, it, it could kind of help cure some uh, uh, ailments that they had um, physically. And what happened was the complete opposite. It spiraled um, totally out of control the wrong way. Uh, their symptoms got worse. And anyway, they, they totally flipped their diet and, and started including um, healthier, high-quality uh, animal proteins. And it's like a light bulb went off. Uh, their bodies reacted. I mean, it's, it's sort of like when you see the slides of like, oh, here's the neighbor's pasture, or here's what you can do after just a short period of time um, with the right animal impact or, or grazing or whatever. It's, that's what their bodies did, uh, literally sort of regenerated uh, when they added that back in. And so anyway, that was the fire that kind of fueled the idea that then was um, uh, what um, started as a, just a, a concept or an idea, like how do we create something that we can carry with us on these uh, endurance runs and, and bike rides um, that is super healthy and nutritious um, and connects, tells the full story um, from, from rancher, boots on the ground to end, end consumer. And so um, anyway, that's a little background. So it's, it's you know. What, what is the product? 
Uh, it's it's a it's a meat. So it's a, the, the, we started with four uh, meat bars when we when we launched um, a, a bison bar, a beef bar, a turkey bar, uh, and a lamb. And these were a combination of 100% uh, grass-fed meats uh, with fruits and nuts and some spice blends uh, mixed into them. And uh, we've obviously it's it's grown from there, and we have I, I'm not exactly sure the number of different SKUs, but um, probably around 50 different SKUs, and it ranges from bone broth to cooking animal fats, cooking oils, um, pork rinds, and, and jerky, and various other things, and maybe talk about that later, about why we even got into all those things, and, 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 and that's part of the whole supply chain, putting the, putting the pieces together, but um, ultimately, that's what it started with, was, was four bars, um, and really a, a, a group of folks in, in Austin, Texas that, that, that cared about land and, and um, um, animals and ultimately consumer health and trying to put all those pieces together and tell the story. Perfect. Thank you. Claire. Thank you. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Claire. I'm the co-executive of Marin Sun Farms and the founder of Mindful Meats. Um, so what we do are we operate two meat brands, Rinsen Farms and Mindful Meats, um, that aggregate uh, whole animals, live uh, livestock from suppliers who raise these animals according to our specific standards, and then we market them. So we are that branded marketer to help um, create uh, consumer awareness about all the amazing work that our suppliers uh, do. Under the Mindful brand, we have one very specific type of source. We work exclusively with pasture-based certified organic dairy producers, and we upcycle their cows who are being retired from milking um, into beef. And then um, on the Marin Sun Farm side... You can say, you can say that you kill them. <laughs> in, this, in this audience, I that's like okay. upcycle. <laughs> well, I like to change the frame of mind, you know. Um, so, uh, on the Marin Sun Farms side, uh, Marin Sun Farms was founded by my husband, and he um, started one of the first 100% uh, grass-fed beef operations here in the Bay Area. So, um, he comes from an agriculture background, I do not. Uh, he started with beef and has since um, built it into 100% um, grass-fed lamb, goat, um, and then fully pastured pork, um, organic pastured chickens, eggs, so on and so forth. Um, and then we also own and operate the last um, USDA slaughter and packing facility in the Bay Area based in Petaluma. Um, definitely not the easiest way to make a living. <laughs> um, but what I will say is, you know, I, I came at this not being from a food, produce, uh, food production or agriculture background. Uh, mainly because I knew from a really young age that I wanted to um, make a, a positive difference in the world. And I really um, translated that over the years into understanding how I would go about doing that and what I was going to do. And um, my, my focus ended up becoming on social entrepreneurship or how to use business as a tool for good. And then I sort of married that with my area of passion, which is food. Uh, love to eat, always have, love to cook, um, grew up in the South, came to California in 2005 and fell in love with the markets here, the farmer's markets and all the bounty. And uh, similarly, I tried to be a vegetarian um, because I didn't want to support uh, the industrial meat production system and I couldn't for health reasons. So that um, led me down this major rabbit hole of um, researching everything there really is to know about meat production. And that led me to becoming a, a supportive consumer of uh, local, locally produced, um, grass-fed and pasture-raised meats. And then I decided that I really wanted to get out of uh, what I was doing, which was technology, and dedicate my time, you know, my life, to something that I'd become truly obsessed with. And um, I decided the best way that I could do that, um, the best way I could really create value um, in the marketplace was by creating a brand that would help connect consumers with food that ranchers were producing and help build um, another avenue for livestock producers who wanted to raise meats in different ways um, to have a different buyer outside of um, you know all the all the big guys in the room and the in the um, 
in the traditional markets. So um, that's, that's sort of my why, how, and what. Didn't you move to Marshall? I did move to Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> I was living in San Francisco, and then um, I realized that I was really actually going to be starting a meat company, which is kind of something that someone who is in technology um, in my, I was like 26 in technology, living that lifestyle. Like when you realize you're actually going to start a meat company, you're like, what? So I, um, <laughs> I moved to Marshall so that I could be closer uh, to the source. And so I could really, you know, get to know the community and really understand uh, what I was doing and really uh, try to come at it from a place of, um, I mean, my intention was fully to come at it very transparently, very true. Um, and to make sure that I was doing the best that I could for, um, for our suppliers, make sure I was getting them the best value in the marketplace, make sure I was like, you know, being a really good partner. Because ultimately, without the supply, you don't have anything in our business. And that is really, really something that it's important to remember. Um, we're not widgets. You can't manufacture this stuff out of, you know, plastic and components that you put together. You know, we work with real people. Um, with stuff grown on the land, and we need to respect that. So, thanks, Albert. <laughs> Hi, I'm Albert Strauss. Um, I have Strauss Family Creamery and uh, and also our dairy farm uh, that my father father started in 1941. I converted to or certified organic. Um, would be the cer first certified organic dairy and creamery west of the Mississippi in the beginning of 1994. So it's 25 years ago. Um, so originally it was to survive as a family farm. And um, over the years, what, I've ch what my personal mission and the mission of our company is, is to sustain family farms in Marin, Sonoma County and by producing 100% certified organic dairy products and to help revitalize rural communities through education and advocacy everywhere. And it kind of goes to, how you talk about yourself, your products, and and the market, and and respecting each other as 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 um, as, as farmers, you know, the relationship between farmers and processors and brands and consumers needs to be a, a we relationship um, where we we work very diff, very hard on. We have now there are ten farms supplying our creamery. We just picked up a. A new, a new little Jersey dairy, a next generation dairy farm, uh, this this week, um, and what the real, what the relationship is, is twice a month when we are required to pay for the milk from the dairies, we hand deliver the check. We don't send them a check. We don't uh, direct deposit. We some from management actually goes out and visits them, hand delivers the check to get that relationship and understanding what farming is, because 99% of the population aren't far never grew up on farms. They don't, there's such a disconnect with where, where your food comes from. And then four times a year, every quarter, we get together all the farms and at the creamery, and we talk about how the creamery is doing and what the challenges are on the farm, and we agree to addendum to our contract to keep the milk production in line with our sales. And as a farmer, I know what it takes to manage a milk supply. So ultimately, if, they produce, if the farmer produces too much milk, we'll leave it in their milk tank. But they learn to manage the supply. So if we have too much milk, which every other processor and every other brand has in, in, in the United States right now, it depresses the price to the farmer. And um, we are able to keep our price over the, the after the five-year drought, we had a shortage of organic milk. We kept our prices. We had to drop our prices 10 to 11 percent versus our competition, dropping their prices 20 to 60 percent. And their farms, organic dairy farms and conventional dairy farms, are going out of business. Um, the success we've had in Rince, Sonoma County is um, over the last you know, 25 years, we have now have 90 percent of our dairies that are certified organic. Um, it's the only way to survive as a family farm. And um, I feel that we really are showing a model of farming that's sustainable, um, not only with uh, our practices. Um, um, we have, I have, a, I have a, a BHAG that I gave my sustainability director. Who knows what a BHAG is? 
Excellent. <laughs> Must be a marketing guy. Uh, anyway, um, big, hairy, audacious goal, which is to be carbon neutral on my farm in the next three years and expand it to the other farms that supply us within the next five to 10 years. We have the first carbon farm, dairy cows, produce all electricity for the farm. Um, the other 20% is add by adding compost using rotational grazing for the cows. We're actually sequestering carbon back into the soil and planting hedgerows and windbreaks. So that's uh, actually carbon farming is being shown as one of the only ways to reverse climate change rather than reduce it. And so it's been recognized by Germany and, and France and actually California just joined. Um, uh, four per meal. Pardon me? Four per meal. Four, four, per yes, four, four, hundred, uh, four tenths of a percent of yes. ca it's carbon, soil it. carbon increase per year. I think, sorry. No, you can get offline. Anyway, I'm getting too much in, into the weeds. But um, so I feel that farms are actually a solution to a farming system and a food system that can be really beneficial to the community, the environment, and the planet. Thanks. My name is Rebecca Burgess, and I'm the executive director of an organization called Fibershed. And the disconnect between food and uh, where it's produced and who eats it, that chasm, I think, is um, several orders of magnitude amplified between the land base and the textiles on our bodies. So we often don't think of wearing as an agricultural act. We think of eating as an agricultural act, but wearing is also an agricultural act. Of course, unless you sourced your fibers from the lithosphere, which is plastic, <laughs> um, which is 70% of what we're dependent on. So all of these little pieces of information I'm sharing with you are just tidbits of a very long narrative that we often use to educate um, as an organization, as a nonprofit organization about a system that has fundamentally broken down. So in California, there were 12 working vertically integrated wool mills in 1891. Prior to the Trans-Pacific, Transnational Railroad System, Trans-Pacific Railway System hooked up with an Atlantic Railway System. And all of a sudden, textiles could come in from post-Civil War, pretty much indentured servitude and ex-slave labor textile mills from the South. And it immediately, and by 1892, 1893, the Treasury reports show our 12 working wool mills disappeared. So our supply chains disappeared in the late 1890s in California due at that time to low wages and a lack of transparency and a lack of not really caring where things come from and wanting to exploit people who you couldn't see or who didn't really know somewhere else. So that has not really changed <laughs> so much in the textile system, but it's starting to. So why I'm involved in this is because I attempted to dress myself with fibers, dyes, and labor within 150 miles of my front door. And that labor component um, you know, it was knitting needles, crochet hooks, a hand-powered, foot-powered loom. The metabolization of raw material in our community was done completely with the opposable thumb and my four fingers and a whole bunch of other people's opposable thumbs and four fingers. However, we have a history of value chains and value addition in this state. We aren't known for textile production in California, but the history's there. We have 3.1 million pounds of wool pulsing off the landscape every shearing season. 900,000 pounds of it is skinned quality, like New Zealand, Australia, you know, 21 micron count and lower. None of it was being utilized when I was doing this wardrobe challenge, and I was recognizing this need for value chains to actually take what is being produced that could offset our reliance on fossil carbon fibers could retain better livelihoods in our family farms. And right now, wool, at the time we were looking at this, was considered a byproduct. So why I'm in this work, my bio, my functional bio, is that we have been looking since 2013 to build a, a facility run off of geothermal energy, wind power, solar power, passive solar, um, water catchment systems, and full recycling of water systems to actually go from a sheep shearing moment 
all the way to a warm, insulating base layer on your skin for something that only costs 10 to 15% more than what Smart Wool would sell it to you for. And we've designed that facility. We have that ready to go. Um, and in the meantime, there's this huge delta between what investors are willing to do to rebuild rural economies <laughs> and what needs to be done. So we have um, that investment chasm. So in the meantime, we've been working really hard at our org to build decentralized facilities. Um, so we're on our third small mill, and small meaning like 100,000 pounds of material per year. Um, maybe 71,000 yards of textile. Um, so what our work is, is we're helping build out the business plans. We're building out some of the financial literacy for those running the, the mills um, who may not have that experience but have passion. And we're um, then looking at how to capitalize those facilities. So we also work in an integrated capital model. We often work combining philanthropy and social impact investment dollars to build, again, grassroots-driven small facilities. But at the end of the day, once we all start really caring about what we wear a lot more, we will see the social pressures drive the larger scale facilities. And I don't mean monolithic facilities. I mean, we just need value chains that represent maybe processing wool for the West or processing wool east of the Mississippi. We need to decentralize these facilities, but we do need to scale up just enough to hit that magic middle point that allows for efficiencies that honor ecology, that honor the price point that someone's willing to pay, and that honor what the farmers need to, to be able to shear sheep and also make a living. So we've done all that economic modeling and we're just playing that out um, now. And so we're in this stage to give you a snapshot of now. Fiber Shed's work is to really um, galvanize and catalytically organize brands that may not have identified that they can work in their backyard, literally, with fiber in their own backyard, 150 miles, 200 miles of their corporate headquarters. And we're galvanizing their relationships with ranchers and farmers to build that sensitivity between the land manager and the designer who spends all their days on a computer. And then what we've been doing is organizing interim supply chains for these brands. And so those interim supply chains is really what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And it is nitty gritty and it's interesting. Um, I love being that technical, I have to say, but I think it would be great to transform this system and keep moving it towards more regionalization, more decentralization, more ecologically thoughtful. And um, I think we're headed there, but that's it. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> none of you, uh, well, three of, three of you don't produce anything that you sell, and Albert, you produce a, a percent because you you have a, you run a dairy and to a certain percentage of of the milk comes from your own cows. Right. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I'm sorry. I'm talking about the mindful meat piece because okay, okay, okay. those are all dairy cows that are purchased from somebody else. Somebody else raises them. That's and, true. And you have to build that but supply chain. I'll put that hat on. I'll leave them. So in so <laughs> talking about talking about mindful meats here for just a minute. Um, all of you are dependent upon other people about buying something that someone else raised. And you remove it from the farm of origin, and then something else happens. Lots of things have to happen. How do you figure out, how do you set the minimum requirements for what you're willing to purchase? Um, do you, you know, is that something that's driven by the market? So the market wants this, so I'm going to go find it? Or is, is it primarily driven by what's available? There's the supply out here. I'm going to go see if I can. One is a pull model. The market asks you to pull this product through a supply chain or to build a supply chain to supply it. The other is a push model. Hey, there's all this really cool undervalued stuff out there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy it. I'm going to figure out how to push it into the marketplace and see if I can get somebody to pay for it. You got the mic, Claire. You can start. All right, I'll start. Um, so that is a, I mean, we could take that question in lots of different directions. Like, how do we look at the nuanced operations of the dairy, and how do we, you know, pick very specific um, dairies with whom we work? But I'll leave that there, and I'll focus on the available supply, um, unless you want me to take it in a different direction. No, anyway. Wherever you want to go is good. So um, when I was getting started and figuring out how to create value in the market, um, this was around 2009, 
and I was um, reading as much as I could and all different types of you know research, actual research to journalistic writing. And you know what I kept coming up against was a bottleneck for processing um, in order to get locally raised. And I was kind of focusing on locally raised at the time, at meat to market. And so I said, okay, well, I'll start a processing facility. Sure, like I'll just start a USDA processing facility. Right. No big deal. That's easy. And um, and so I, you know, similarly did a feasibility study and like you know had a modular system all designed, costing, you know, financials, the whole deal. And then what I realized was that I needed to have throughput in order to keep of my own meat, not just making it available for uh, processing services, because what the market is willing, and by market I mean um, livestock producers who direct market you know, their meat, what they're willing to pay for processing services does not cover the cost of operating a USA processing plant. So therefore you have to sell right. your own product. So where was I gonna get this, you know, product of my own. And um, I was looking at USDA slaughter data, um, always fun on a Saturday night, and um, I noticed that around 15% of, on average, depending on the year, of the beef that we eat in this country comes from the dairy industry. Um, and most people just don't know that, but it makes sense. I think that was something that, you know, the conventional system really made sense. You had this supply, it wasn't wasted, it was utilized. So at the same time, I was looking at um, the organic market and noticed that dairy was the second fastest growing um, uh, type of product in the organic system after vegetables. And so that, you know, kind of put my light bulb up and said, well, that's interesting. You know, are those animals available for um, organic meat? How are they raised? as I started to research beyond Marin and Sonoma and the Bay Area at the same time, I realized the same was happening um, in other major hubs of organic dairy production across the country. So no one had really tapped into um, basically taking this beautiful animal and appreciating it for, for what it really is. And so that's when I stepped in and said, hey, like we're a meat company, a beef company that can find you know, pasture-raised organic certified meat that's available. And that is where I just sort of hit the ground running with the brand because that's been, you know, one of the, the most challenging things in food production is how do you get that supply? So that's the, that's I guess the pushing it out part. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. But we do a lot. I mean, we have to let people know that we exist in the world, but, <laughs> but yeah. Um, for us, I think it was, um, and I'm not the, the, the marketer, but the way I see it through like the supply chain piece of it, when we started, no one knew what the hell Epic was or meat bars or continent concept was sort of foreign. So yeah, it, it, definitely there was a, this curve in the, the early stages where we were certainly we thought and we believed that yeah, we had to push things in front of people and we had to build a brand and we had to educate people and we had to tell the story um, of folks. And I think over the years, things have m morphed and they, they've changed where we're doing less of that and, and we're probably doing more of like the, the, the pool model. And what I mean by that, I'll, I'll use bison and Todd can relate to this as a good example. When we started with our first one of our first bars, it was a bison bar. And um, it was a 100% grass-fed bison bar. And once we made that product and we started selling it, um, there was a, a lot of interest in that. A lot of folks wanted it, consumers, retailers, everyone. And we were like, oh, this is fantastic. And then I quickly realized, oh, shit. There aren't that many bison. Like, we're, this is, this is gonna be tough. Um, and so, and, and not only that, but there's not a, a, a lot of bison that'll, that'll meet the 100% grass-fed claim either. And so we had to, like, had a moment of truth and, like, where you have this moment where you pivot and you go, well, what do we do now? And it was like, well, we, we get bison that are grain supplemented um, and we create another product and we, we, we make that transparency to the consumer um, but we use this as a building block that if the consumer really demands and they're asking for this very specific component of, of grass-fed, then 
we, um, we, help, we help go back into the supply chain and, and tell folks like, hey, this is what the consumer is asking. Like, how do we work with you over time to, to build that? Um, and so we, we built the brand, I guess, and, and, and as sales and things keep growing, we had to go back into that supply chain and sort of pull people and say, hey, look, can you work with us to, to make over time um, changes um, to get to a um, sort of a supply chain that consumers are asking for? Uh, and so that's one example. And we've had to do that, you know, over various, it could be, I just use bison as an example, but over various proteins, like we've, we've been able to, that's sort of how we've, how we've modeled and, and been able to keep up with um, the supply meeting the, the, the claims um, and the demand that consumers want, so. So I heard the question a little differently. I, I, I'm hearing whether the market is a push or a pull. And um, for us, we, have, we had a unique product in the very beginning. There was no certified organic dairy products on the market. Uh, now, excuse me, uh, any milk that was on the mil market. We came out in reusable glass bottles, um, which are making a comeback because recycling is broken. Um, but I think what it is is that, so there's a natural pull from consumers for a quality product that has, has something behind it, has a message of uh, land practices, mm -hmm. animal practices, and a quality of a, a product that uh, is minimally processed, doesn't have additives, and is not overly pro uh, uh, So consumers had a pull initially, and I think as we come out with new products that, have, that we don't compromise our quality and we don't underprice it, we feel that our quality actually is better than our competitions we still command a premium and actually retailers even take a bigger premium on it because they feel that they can. So there's a certain amount of pull, but then at a certain point we also have to do uh, a push. So that's what a sales department does. That's what a, um, you know, we have a lot, of, a lot of things we do as a company to try to keep people buying our products and, and, our, and, and demos and um, a little bit of, we've never done much advertising. We're starting to do a little bit of advertising. But as a small, smaller company, um, what we were doing was farmers, we still do farmers markets. We still do a lot of things to get out into the public, have them understand what our products are, what the quality is, have them taste it, put it in their mouth, and then the message behind it. The, the, and for us to get the supplies is not a problem. There's always, a lot of milk out there, and as I said, 90% of the dairies are certified organic because that's where, uh, that's the only way to survive. And, and we we're getting to a point where I feel that farmers can start to pay themselves as a manager of their own business. It, it is a business, farming is a business. And if it can't be economically viable, where they can uh, invest in their infrastructure and look at succession to the next generation, it's not going to be around, and we have, you know, maybe one percent of the farms that we used to have in 1940. So we need to change how we how we practice and how we compensate and get the true cost of food. So we've tried to do pretty exact matchmaking between what a brand needs and not bringing the supply forward too much. And what I mean by not bringing the supply forward too much is that like ahead of the demand, is that we develop wool pools based on their climate benefit, which is measurable through computer modeling that we use to understand, uh, which Albert illuminated with his description of hedgerows and windbreaks, um, compost applications, adaptive managed grazing. When you stack all these different practices together and you apply those practices where appropriate where the farmer, rancher, land manager would like these practices to be implemented to improve ecological function of the system that they're managing. We call this a carbon farm plan. <laughs> and so we work with um, different agencies to help fund carbon farming on these landscapes. So our, our 
bringing forward a climate benefiting wool pool is a quite uh, dynamic process that includes partnerships with the NRCS, Resource Conservation Districts, Point Blue, um, sometimes other partners in the community, native plant nurseries that we do um, orders with, you know, a year in advance before we put the plant palette in for that hedgerow type that, you know, that we want. So we thoughtfully approach building the climate beneficial wool pool through a series of relationships that precede even calling it climate benefiting wool. And we let the brands know that we can do this on their behalf. So Koyuchi Bedding Company, um, wanted to work with Climate Beneficial Wool, and now they're doing so within 12 miles of their corporate headquarters in Point Ray Station. They're working with Stumple Creek Ranch and Jim Jensen. And so um, Jim, Jim actually is one of the people developing carbon farm plans in our community through MALT, which is um, what Ellen Strauss helped create with Phyllis Faber. It's a very small community out here. Uh, Stumple Creek Ranch, most of you probably know um, Lauren Poncha's work. He was the one of three to, f to have a carbon farm plan out of the Marin Carbon Project. He's been in doing compost applications for some time. We've been working with their wool. And when Koyuchi was like, well, we'd like to work with this wool, we, we went to these ranchers and we just said, how far have you gotten with your carbon farm plan implementation? Where can we help you? Um, where is your wool going right now? In both cases, it wasn't going very far. It was being stored in barn rafters or it was being ditched. Um, so there wasn't any real added value that they were seeing from the wool. So we said, well, okay, let's help you get, you know, an annual implementation of your carbon farm plan um, going through whatever we need to do to do that with its healthy soils grants equip and start measuring the greenhouse gas uh, drawdown metrics related to how much wool you're producing, find out what the climate impact of that wool is and then move it through Koyuchi's supply chain. And so we just slowly, iteratively go back and forth between what the brand's asking and what the producers can literally produce in a way that's impacting soil productively, um, having measurable impact on our climate. And a lot of it's just this kind of a uh, little bit of a tennis match um, in, a, in a loving way, <laughs> back and forth. So. Yeah, we don't create more supply than we have demand for at this time. We really try to be careful about that right. as it's piloting. So it, it sounds to me like you're actually, the initial pr product that you sell is a, a very, very precise set of claims that a brand can utilize for a particular product, a particular project. It's not going to be their entire product line. It's just going to be maybe one, one piece of it that they can experiment and explore with. Correct. We and call then, them micro lines. Yeah, and then, then yeah. You, you know, you basically say, if you want these claims, I'll go build you the supply chain. Now, I need some time, but I, it starts with that commitment. And, exactly. And, and based on what I know about you, Kirk, you've done very something very similar with the grass-fed bison space. You started by saying, My, I could use X number of pounds of bison trim, and you know, what do I need to do to help you build out that supply chain so that I can purchase that? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's yeah, that's a very right. accurate statement. Because again, I mean, that's exactly what we've had to do in in the space early on. We were, we probably did the, we built more demand right. than we had. You overshot a little bit. Yeah, just a little, right? Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Um, and so that's exactly right. We we started getting creative, and what that meant was is just get. I mean, have an open, honest conversation with, with our partners, our supply partners, and say, what do we do? How do we get there together? Um, and that would mean maybe multi-year sort of supply agreements where we say, like, hey, if you, if you do it, like, we will we'll, we'll be there at the end to, to, to purchase um, the material, the meat from you. Um, if you raise it within these standards and these ways, um, to meet our internal claims and to, um, you know, um, be able to make sure that we're, we're, we're healing some land and making an impact along the way. So, yeah, that's exactly how we, and we still continue to do that, and we still learn every day. It's not like we have some model that's, like, perfect and we've got it figured out because that's not the case. We're, we're still working with folks. Um, we still are trying to learn and understand, like, what, what truly is the right way? Like, what do farmers and ranchers need um, from us in order to, to help 
um, ensure that what they're doing, they can continue to do for years and years and years after, if, if that's their goal. Right. Let's talk a little bit about marketing. Um, I would guess that nearly 100% of what all of you sell does not involve a personal transaction between you and the end eater or, or where. Is that, would that be reasonably accurate? Pretty close to 100%. I mean, it's not. It's not maybe not 100, but how how many of what what percentage of your total sales involve you personally interacting with the end user? I I think direct consumers more like farmers markets. Um, yeah, right. I mean, so it's yeah, it's a very small percentage. It's, right. So, it's, um, so with, with that assumption, then you don't have that personal interaction with your customers. How do you how do you message? How do you communicate? How do you articulate? what your brand stands for and why they should pay the, the premium price that you're asking for it. So what we've done is um, we've just done a re... They call it not rebrand. Uh, we've refreshed our packaging to make it more um, mission... Well, messaging more consistently across uh, the lines of ice cream, yogurt, butter, um, milk, um, and different products. So we're people... The consumer can see it on the shelf and it also has... Uh, icons that talk about uh, pasture fed, um, farmer first, um, environment. So there are different icons and different things that, on the packaging. We also have redone our website uh, to to really kind of bring forward uh, more of our uh, in a better way to be able to optimize it on cell phones and and be able to do stuff like that. Um, we're doing we start as I said we're starting to do some a little bit of advertising, print advertising right now. Um, and going around and uh, talking a lot of places. Um, but there's, you know, so we're, there's a lot of, we've also invested in people uh, in our company to, to do mark, more marketing. Um, so, I mean, I would say 99% of our product um, on the Mindful line is sold wholesale. Uh, we do under MSF have uh, butcher shops, so we we sell some, you know, directly that way. But um, honestly, we really um, developed. So I developed very targeted relationships with specific clients or customers um, who would be evangelists for the brand, and that's really how how I did it. Um, and I did that by um, it was really a marriage of my values and what I wanted to see come forward and then um, a little bit of happenstance and luck uh, in the marketplace. So um, part of my goal when I started Mindful Meats was to figure out how to get uh, pasture-raised, organic, um, local, non-GMO beef, because we're also the first non-GMO project verified beef company in the U.S., to um, public schools. So how do you get really clean meat um, to replace conventionally raised meat in public schools? So um, over the years, we developed relationships with public school di uh, districts in California, um, gave them very favorable pricing, of course. And um, the first one was Oakland Unified School District, which was a leader, uh, is a leader in um, sustainable food sourcing. And so um, through Oakland, Mindful really, you know, was publicized through writing journals, um, you know, research papers, news articles, you, know, you name it. So we became known. And, and, and how we were um, looked at as a beef company was really unique because I, I really fell in love with the um, resource allocation, resource use of the dairy beef. You know, a, a, a cow is very, very efficient. She produces you know, tens of thousands of pounds of food in her lifetime in milk, and then at the end of it, you get 600 pounds of meat. And so all the, you know, water, pasture, um, extra feed, whatever that goes into that animal, um, that pound of beef is spread across all of the production of her milk. So she's very, very resource efficient when you look at what it takes to produce a meat protein. Um, and so that, um, that concept was really latched onto by a number of key uh, customers. So Oakland Unified is our kind of public school shining star. Bon Appetit Management Company was another huge sure. buyer who I went after ruthlessly. Well, that's kind of the wrong word, tenaciously. Tenaciously. <laughs> and tenaciously. Like, we'll <laughs> and then um, the fun part really came from the chef side. 
Um, so uh, the the flavor profile of a dairy cow is different for a number of reasons. You know, a different breed, Holstein, Jersey, crosses, and then you've peppered in a bunch of other different types of breeds. Um, but primarily because she's an older animal. And so this concept of mature meat was not really big at all when Mindful was getting started. Um, it was happening in Europe primarily. And then we had chefs absolutely fall in love with our product. When we uh, harvested our first cow, um, we, took, um, we took her to a number of our favorite chefs and they said, honestly, we thought we were gonna be a ground beef company because everyone said like, good luck getting a steak out of a dairy cow, it's never gonna happen. And so we just, you know, tried it out on some of our chefs and they said this is the best meat we've ever had, um, the umami, the, all that stuff chefs say. And then, um, you know, when are you selling? Can we get more? And so I said, well, that's interesting. Um, so from that point forward, we really started doing some deep dive on, you know, carcass utilization and um, how do you, you know, take that from a live animal down to, you know, packaged products. Uh, but I really broke when um, we had Jose Andreas, who's a celebrity chef, and you guys um, might be familiar with him. He's also the humanitarian who fed Puerto Rico, so you've probably known of him through that. He um, was searching for um, vaca vieja, or literally translates to old cow. He's Spanish, and he wanted this flavor profile that only comes from an older animal. And, um, you know, the legend goes, so he says he tasted... 500 different cuts of ribeye um, from different animals and producers in the United States. And it wasn't until he tried Mindful that he said, this is the one. And so from there, he took us into his Las Vegas restaurant and now we're in his New York restaurant and um, so on and so forth. And he really, I mean, last year he named Mindful Meats as the supplier of old cows in Forbes for the, you know, top one of the top 10 trends in food in the United States. And so that's really been, that's kind of the, I didn't work for that one, that fell in my lap, but has been really amazing from the culinary side to help us move that forward. And we, we do as much as we can to appreciate him. <laughs> yeah, right. say thanks. So let me get this so. straight, and all of you, how many of you are cattle producers here? So you started by buying or certified organic cold dairy cows that were valued at by, at their commodity market price. Bottom tier, yeah. And figured out, well, that's easy. I can upsell them for organic ground beef. Yes. Great. And then you figured out how to sell ribeyes out of those, at least some of them. Yes. And market them as the ultra, ultra premium, more expensive than prime feedlot beef. Yes. 100%. Is so, that not just marketing brilliance? Just I, mean, to, that, you know. I, I think that does deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, yep. I'll give you a, a price you know, example. So um, in Vegas, they, we are sold as, uh, you can basically go and get you know, sliced cut of ribeye from Jose's favorite top three beefs. There's a prime, there's a Wagyu, and then there's Vaca Vieja Mindful Meats. Um, it costs, the last price I saw was $72 a pound. Um, and then we also, just sold, uh, I was telling Aubrey this earlier. So we, um, we're we looking through it. We, ha we do have the value of owning our processing facility, which is huge. I mean, if you have to have excellent partners with your processors in order to do what we do. But um, so, you know, David and I were walking through the plant uh, a couple weeks ago, looking at carcass quality. And we spotted this like absolutely amazingly beautiful um, Jersey cow, I mean, the most golden fat you'll ever, you could possibly imagine. I'm like Instagramming it, you know. I hate social media, but I'm doing it. And, um, and so that animal was going to go for ground beef, for trim. And David and I were like, uh-uh. So we took that cow and we sent her to our Oakland butcher shop as sort of a test to see what our Oakland customers would go for. Well, they sold suet fat for $10 a pound. They sold ribeyes for $50 a pound. They sold roasts for $18 a pound. I mean, you name it, it was astounding. So what that shows you is that there is a really, really growing demand out there for unique things in the marketplace. You know, I think this isn't just, you know, Mindful can go out and sell a ton of dairy cows. 
uh, which we are hopefully, you know, we're doing a decent job of now and hopefully we'll continue to be able to do. But um, the, I think this also is really an interesting, you know, point for individual direct marketers to say, you know, hey, like, there are customers out there who are really wanting different things. They want to try new things. And so find that angle for your product and let them know what it is. That's awesome. I love that story. Thank you. you that, that like two minutes is going to be in our highlight reel for, next, for the next year's grass fed exchange for sure. I won't say Thanks, the Bob. prices necessarily, but, but we are for sure going to use that. Great. Um, Anybody else want to weigh in on how do you, you, you don't get the benefit of a handshake, and I know you personally, I'm looking in your eyes, and when you, can, you don't need a certification, you don't need any claims, you can just trust me because you've been at my farm, you know how I raise my animals. In the absence of that, what do you, what do, you do? There's nothing as good as that. No. But I'm what do you do instead? And I'm, so, I'm not the I'm not the marketer, so this is kind of a no. Uh, but you know, but you I mean yeah. you're the supply guy, supply yeah. chain guy. But I mean it's really just being authentic and and transparent with people. They just want to know um, where things are coming from, how they're sourced, where they're raised, and so just I mean from day one we've always been as you know just authentic and upfront with folks. And the avenues to do that have ranged from you know social media to um, we put out a publication annually called the Impact Journal where we highlight um, suppliers and tell their stories and get that out into the public as, as much as we can as, you know, as well through um, our website just telling everyone it's sort of a, you know, just an open book of, of, of that supply chain of where things come from. Um, so anyway, that's part of the marketing. But what I will add is like deep diving kind of like what, what you to tag on to what, what you guys do and what I think has helped us uh, build even greater partnerships with folks is um, a lot of the products that we made and that we have created and developed over the years, folks are like, oh, well, gosh, how did y'all come up with that or why did you decide to do that? And the reality of it is it was sitting down at a dinner table with our supplier and saying, hey, like, what are your pain points? What, at the, at the end of every month, what are the items that stack up that you're just struggling, like that are holding you back, that, that, that you're like, gosh, if I could figure out a way to move that or sell that. And okay, well, let's buy your bones and we're gonna figure out how to make bone broth. Does that help? Oh, absolutely. Like if I could, you know, if you can do that, that would be amazing. Okay, what about the fat? Like that's, I'm paying someone to take that away now it's costing me money um, and I'm like well could I pay you for that and and let's create cooking oils um, and so a lot of our product development over time is really focused on like the carcass utilization it's not like we had this magic like oh we, we saw the trends it's like gosh how do we how do we help the the, the partners grow and continue to do what they want to do and, and kind of fuel you know put some fuel back into the um, the folks that are doing it. So yeah. right, because it, certainly it's an unusual move for a CPG company to go from a bar to yeah, a right. jar full of fat. Exactly, I mean, exactly. Right. I mean, we started with meat bars, right? It, it, but, right. But, but but even on even on the even on the bars, like we weren't, we didn't know enough to. I mean, go into it like that. We're specifying these exact cuts or this type. It's sort of like, hey, what's what is um, available in the marketplace, or what are you struggling with to move, or that you're not getting as much value out of it as, as you want. Um, let us take that and see if we can recreate it in the form of a bar um, and add more value back, back into the, the stream. Market it and sell it at a price point that's similar to other like products on the shelf, um, but that I'm also able to pay you a bit more for it than you would just, you know, I don't know, dumping it into the, into the market or getting whatever you can get. So yeah, making starting from a bar and now making pork rinds and cracklings and cooking fats, you know, it was, right. it's all just been an evolution. Rebecca, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you put the relationships together with these, these fiber brands and uh, how you add value to them. Sure. Is anyone a wool producer in the audience? Does anyone have sheep? You keep your hands up. <laughs> okay. Okay. Just wanted to be relevant. Um, so 
one of the things that I was told when I started looking at what local fibers, local within 150 miles of my front door, local would, would be, what would be available, um, different farmers told me <clears throat> that California wool was not high enough quality to touch human skin. And I heard that from people who were literally also, they were raising sheep and they were telling me that. <laughs> so I thought, well, you know, and then there was this move to go to Dorper's um, self-shedding sheep and a lot of, um, even an extension agent had told me that that's, that that's where everyone's going. Wool is out the door, you don't, there's, there's no role for this. So um, that was the climate that I was walking into around this material and I was watching 500 pound bales um, just sit and go moldy. I was seeing wool actually just getting tossed in ditches um, and then sheep shears storing whole barns full of wool hoping someday maybe they could take enough of it to the commodity market to make it pay. So it was um, definitely a climate of not seeing yeah, value. That's intimidating. I mean, yeah. I, nobody's going to fund that business plan, you know? No, and I didn't Let's, write one. Um, no, right, so exactly, right. <laughs> that sounds like mine, you know, <laughs> when I started. So then the idea was, well, um, we did this analysis, so I worked with some capstone students at UC Davis. It's great to work with students when you have an opportunity. They were part of a new agricultural educational you know, undergrad program for food systems. And eight students I started to work with, and we went around the state during the sheep shearing season, and we took two fingers width of wool from the softest sheep, and you know, just from touch perspective, and the coarsest sheep for in each flock. And we went up and down the state, and it took four months, and we worked um, extensively with the USDA, and we sent all of our two fingers width wool to these micron analyses microscopes, and we got back data, and we fed that data back to the farmers. And we had a farmer literally with 17.9 micron count wool, which is finer than anything that it was a beautiful color, it was a merino, it was just gorgeous, this amazing wool, and it was finer than what you would see um, in Icebreaker or something that you would see very well promoted by a wool brand coming out of like New Zealand, for instance. And so when we started to understand the qualitative and quantitative realities, when we mapped quantitative and qualitative realities for our region, um, and we actually used the micron testing to help us do that, and some of the staple length and tensile strength testing, and we looked at the breed diversity, we started to understand there's this whole gradient of wool, right? And some of this wool that the farmers who were raising the sheep said should never touch human skin, it turns out that it has this incredible bounce factor. It crimps just the right way so that when you sit on it, it kind of just wants to come back. These are the Dorset Suffolk crosses in our area. And this wool makes incredible, incredible bedding. So to offset our reliance on polyesters or any kind of fossil carbon stuffing, we can use the Dorset Suffolk cross. And so all this wool that was in ditches now could end up and is starting to go into a bedding line. So we built a relationship with the oldest wool processing facility in the United States in Frankenmuth, Michigan. As I was saying, we're, we're developing these interim strategies for processing. And because wool is not perishable, like some of the things that you manage, we can do some of that shipping. It's not great for our footprint, but it's what we have to do at the moment. So Frankenmuth Mill, this small family-owned mill in Michigan, started selling in Michigan climate beneficial wool bedding in Michigan. And it, they said they had a 500% increase in sales. Wow. So that was great. <laughs> um, and then the last thing I'll say is that the finer wool, we ended up, you wanted to talk about the North Face. Yeah, right. So we're, we did end up seeing that some of the wool was high enough quality to be worn on human skin. Um, that wool, we just built relationships. So I don't have a marketing background or um, a finance background. So my, my role is just bring people to ranches and get them in the soil and with the animals. So we built out a relationship with the product develop teams at the North Face and brought them onto ranches on biodiesel buses. And I would tour them around Solano County ranches that they just needed to see like, how sheep graze and what does this system look like. 
and we got one really young, bushy-tailed product manager who just stormed her company and just said, "This, we are going to make a backyard project um, out of this wool. We can do all the climate metrics for what's going on on farm. And so she spearheaded now what has turned into um, Fast Company um, honored it as one of the game-changing innovations. It's wool, <laughs> but um, it was a, a beanie that has now turned into an infinity scarf product line and a coat. This coat was actually, it's 100% all from one ranch. So this is traceable back to Bear Ranch in Modoc County, California. Um, and the Estelle family has been super excited to, to watch their wool finally stay domestic, because uh, their wool was, if it w did hit the commodity market, would often go to China for processing. And so now we've um, domesticated the supply chain, and we have now a project that is traceable to their ranch. That's awesome. yeah. So one, one of the things that occurs to me is we're starting to do some mentoring. We're starting to get to really focus on mentoring on the production side. We're not doing any of that on the marketing side. These people are brilliant. No, they wake up in the morning and their brains work differently than, than producers. You know, they they want to go out and figure out, how do I take something that's trash, that's in the ditch, and sell it and, and add value to it and make it so valuable that people want to pay a lot of money for it? How do I take a, a, a dairy cow that's worth 50 cents a pound and sell the, sell the steak out of that for $50 a pound? And that's, that's the purpose of the panel. That's why I was so excited to have them here. These stories are really inspirational. Um, so um, one of the things that I've, uh, as we, as all of you communicate with customers in a way that it doesn't have that personal interaction and you use more social media, uh, there's people that don't like you. There's people that, that want to pick a fight with you. There's people that want to pick apart your label claims or, or your claims or how do you how do you deal with that? Because um, that's just a reality of modern marketing is that there's going to be people that um, have a different worldview or a different perspective, a different agenda than you do. And uh, Kirk, we'll let you start with this I'll start one. With that uh, one. I, I mean, you you've taken some heat in the last few months over some things, and yeah, no, for sure. Um, and and like I said earlier, I think you know as you grow and as you you push boundaries and, and you're, you're, you're doing things that are, might um, uh, go against other beliefs or conventional norms. Um, and, and as you grow, the larger you get, it's sort of like the, the bigger target that you have on your back for, for folks to, to come in. And, you know, from a, from a personal level, um, I mean, we're just not all perfect. And we've, we've never claimed to be perfect um, I wish I could wake up every day and, and, and do everything with absolute excellence and perfection and not make a single mistake. Um, but I think, you know, part of this whole conference is about regenerative ag. And every day that we operate and run our business, it's sort of we're regenerating ourselves. I think I've even heard people relate to that, like, personally. And so um, we just, quite frankly, I mean, there are times that we might, uh, mess up or get it wrong, but we're still striving to go in the right direction. Um, and you know, so anyway, I, I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, you know, how do we how do we deal with the negative interaction? I think you, you take it like everything else that that you get. I mean, there's ups and downs in every business. There's days where you're going, "Gosh, what do we do? This was way harder than we ever could have dreamed and imagined." Um, you know, it's just like you take those days and you, and you keep going. It's the same way with, with whether it's a consumer or a, a publication or, or whatever it is. I think at some point you, you, you can't let that stuff um, get you down and you can't get too caught up in the weeds of, of all those little things. You have to keep the bigger long-term picture in mind um, and just understand that as far as I know, there may be perfect folks in the world, but I'm certainly not. Um, and our company is not perfect, but we sure as heck try to do the best we can. So anyway, I don't know if that answers it sort of or not. Anybody else? Um, I'll say, uh, you know, we we don't really have, um, which is great, we haven't really had too many negative interactions on social media, so that's wonderful. 
Um, but, you know, uh, operating a USDA processing facility, a slaughterhouse, um, there are animal act rights activists out there in the world. Um, and, you know, I think that the way that we handle it is we try to be the bigger person in the room and respect their right to protest and have their opinions and do their thing. And, um, and then we just make sure everything that we're doing is, you know, to our, our values, and that's what it is. And, um, and so we, we haven't seen too much of that around the processing facility, which is great. Um, we haven't seen very much on farm, like for our products, um, but we do know that they're out there um, and we do know that they have agendas and they do target specific things. And, um, you know, I think the most frustrating thing, particularly with animal rights activists, is that they just promote misinformation, a lot of misinformation. They just like make up stuff in their heads. And, um, and then they, yeah, there are all these crazy tools out there for them to use, like drones these days. And so, um, so, you know, I think that our role is really to just continue being as transparent um, as we possibly can to let uh, people and consumers know that we're proud of what we do, this is what we do, and we're, you know, we're happy to serve the customer base who want to work with us. And uh, we do carry certifications at the facility where animal welfare approved recommended, you know, for example. So that helps, uh, you know, helps with that certification stand behind um, how we handle the processing piece. But, you know, another challenge that we run up again with the mindful line is how um, the product displays in retail case because the meat is darker and richer. And those of you who have niche products who have you know, different breeds of animals or um, different ages of animals, you know, your product is gonna look different than a conventional product. And so what we come up against is, well, you know, that meat looks old because it's red. <laughs> Instead of like, that's beef, it's red, you know? So um, a lot of the old school butchers who were trained to, you know, buy your commodity, feedlot fed young steer look at our animals and say, that is bad. And so we just have to give them product to eat, you know, and we just have to educate their staff. And then they really understand like, okay, wow, this is really delicious. Um, you know, actually this kind of tastes like beef, amazing. And then they go back and they'll try it next to, you know, their conventional product. We don't win everybody over, I'm not, you know, to be honest, but we do win a good portion of people over. But it really also comes back to the fact that they, they recognize that they're supporting their neighbors and their local community members in their region by buying this product. You know, they, there is still that, that desire in our country to support local and regionally produced things, be it uh, fiber, be it food, you know, whatever it is. And so that is, um, you know, that also, that part of the story helps um, overcome naysayers. Well, I think there's, there's, there's a big job for us to do to, to educate consumers as to the real facts and decision-making process that we have to make as farmers every day. And why we do these decisions. Yes, we are always looking at improving, but um, there's, as I said before, there's such a, a disconnect that I think a lot of my job and a lot of our job as a, as, as a brand is to educate consumers as to what the real facts are. A lot, of, a lot of consumers don't understand themselves as mammals, much less cows. So it's... it's um, it's it's a sad fact, but it's um, uh, you know they I wish they treat people as well as they treat an, uh, as we treat animals. So it's uh, um, so yes, I think it's education. It's being out there um, address. We have we have people at, uh, taking consumer uh, consumer um, questions and, and answering them to the best of best of ability. Uh, having standards, uh, as you said, uh, we're, we've been certified organic, we're verified non-GMO, we, we were the first non-GMO creamery in North America, um, uh, verified non-GMO. Um, and 
there's a lot of practices that we do that have a basis in animal health, welfare, and uh, putting out high quality products. And it, and it sounds like from what you said earlier, you've, you've got a renewed focus on telling how good you are and getting that, getting that story out there. I, you do I a lot of great things. I don't think it's how good you are. It's, it's, it's how we're trying to how committed you farm. Are. Yeah. Well, it's, it's how you're farming and how you're putting out the best, high, uh, taking care of the, the animals and the right. planet and the land and, and, and putting a high quality product out. So it's not saying I'm better than anybody else. It's just saying these are the, these are the practices and decisions we have to make as farmers and, 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 and create a viable farming system that's, that can, we can support our, our families and our businesses. Well, uh, I think from the standpoint of the fiber system, we sometimes have found ourselves kind of couched between when we worked with um, the North Face, they are owned by the VF Company, which is a transnational uh, largest textile corporation on planet Earth today. And they do a lot of damage in their supply chain outside of what they did with us. That's to be real about it. And we also work with small diaspora of designers all over the Bay Area who are young women and men getting their start out of design school. And so what we've tried to do around telling these stories about working with this gradient of like a transnational corporation all the way down to someone who is just graduating and starting their own line out of school uh, is that we've looked for what we call the waterfall effect moments where we can actually take material coming off a farm or ranch, move it through a supply chain, and allow for small designers who could never make the minimums at those, in those supply chains, we actually allow them to tag on their designs for textile, their knit structure, their woven structure as a tack on to the transnational brand that's using the same mill. So we've started like the California Cloth Foundry is a small artisan female-owned business out of San Francisco that started after the North Face launched its 2014 Backyard Cotton Hoodie program. This other business got to actually loft itself on the what we call the coattails or the waterfall effect of meeting the minimums in these higher minimum mills. Uh, this particular coat I'm wearing launched a direct-to-consumer ran woman-owned ranch yarn-based, uh, yarn-based, ranch-based, <laughs> woman-owned business so Lonnie Estelle, the rancher at Bear Ranch, got to start her own wool company because she can now get through the minimums at the last remaining uh, pin-drafted wool top facility in the country because the North Face's order gets her wool through the supply chain at the same time. So what we've been able to do from a marketing standpoint, what we need to do a better job of is tell those stories of how some large monolith can serve to loft small businesses getting off the ground, more direct-to-consumer businesses, more of that face-to-face -face that we want in our lives, in our local economies. We are very targeted about our work with the big brands. The big brands are bullhorns. They are mainly marketing machines. And so we have to be very careful how we work with big brands because they're very good marketing machines but they don't own the supply chains they depend on, these transnational corps. So you have to be very careful playing ball with them, and you have to make sure that you keep your eye on the prize, which is regional economic development and really direct markets that get you the price points that are really gonna serve you at the end of the day and give you in perpetuity markets. Because the North Face could come and go. There's no contract in perpetuity with them. So to build a sustainable family-owned business in the long haul, we need to be building another economy while we're working with these other big guys. And that's just the nature of a publicly traded shareholder-operated corporation. It's not that the people involved in TNF or General Mills or whatever are bad people. It's just that their design doesn't allow for the kind of prosperity we need for our rural communities in the long haul. So I think we have to be honest about marketing how we're honoring the small people in this community, which we are all small people. <laughs> right. And uh, you're not small. <laughs> um, 
So I, I just want to be clear about why we do what we do and why we're in these relationships because we're honestly trying to build other structures to come in on the coattails. So we're very conscious about the creation of those coattail waterfall opportunities.